Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hudson Institute. Today we dedicate our conference to Colombia, a beautiful country with beautiful people. You see here the product of those magnificent Colombia. <laughs> A heroic nation which unfortunately has had to struggle with the plague of drugs plus military and civil unrest of diverse kind. Notwithstanding all the adverse challenges it has had to face, Colombia has emerged as a notably notable democracy which says a great deal of its tenacious people. Nowadays, one of the most relevant deba debates in Colombia and the Western Hemisphere concerns the peace agreement with the radical guerrillas that have shed so much innocent blood of Colombians. Last year, we had the distinct honor to welcome former president of Colombia, Dr. Álvaro Uribe. He came thanks to the welcoming guide of my colleague, Dr. John Walters. We all learn a great deal from this distinguished statesman. For some of us, though not Colombian citizens, the current peace process remains a mystery. Appalled, we watch in the press pictures taken in Havana of the current president of Colombia smiling and shaking hands with bosses of the Colombian Marxist guerrillas. To shed light on the meaning and objectives of this peace process and the treaties it has generated, we have invited, invited a distinguished Colombian politician and parliamentarian, Ms. Maria Fernanda Caval. She comes preceded by a solid democratic standing and prestige and a fighting spirit in pro of freedom in her country. Also with us, and seated with us in the podium, Ms. Gabriela Febres Cordero, a widely known Colombian activist of democracy and human rights. She will speak later in our program. Before we proceed ahead, let me thank Ms. Rachel Cox, our Director of Public Programs for her valuable support to this event. Also, let me advise you that after all speakers have spoken, we'll open a period for questions and answers. Now, we have asked the uh, Vice President of Hudson, Dr. John Walters, who for eight consecutive years was the drug czar of the U.S., a gentleman, a dear friend, and a teacher. He has a deep knowledge and understanding to the war on drugs in the United States, Latin America, and beyond. And let's give Dr. Walters a warm welcome to the podium. Thank you, Jaime. Sure. Everything all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to just welcome our distinguished panelists and uh, uh, to Hudson. Thank them for joining us. I also want to publicly thank Jaime, this is Darren Blooms here as well, uh, for this series. Um, as uh, some of you know that work in this area, and I know uh, Jaime and our panelists know, um, some of the ignorance which is um, crippling in the United States about uh, the realities in Latin America what our, both our friends and our enemies are doing and what uh, the United States can do to make its own interest and the interests of our friends and allies better. Much of that ignorance is because uh, there is indifference, but more of that ignorance is because the stories are not told in a fair way. No way. That the institutions that claim to represent the, uh, uh, the face of, of Latin America in Washington, D.C. are not the reality of our friends and those struggling for democracy and development and freedom. Uh, Colombia is one of those uh, countries that uh, uh, understanding in Washington is not adequate. And uh, I, I, again, I want to thank uh, 
Ambassador Darren Bloom for bringing a series of, of, of programs together here to help correct that because at the end of the day, we are a country governed by uh, the people and the people need to understand what the issues are when they're making decisions through their representatives. Colombia, as, as Colombians know, but as many Americans don't, has been a long, long time ally of the United States, not only in terms of uh, uh, trade and uh, the sharing of, uh, of uh, business in this hemisphere, but the uh, Colombian people have mixed their treasure and blood with the blood of the families of America in conflicts around the globe going back decades. Uh, we're, for example, many Americans don't know that Colombians fought with the United States in Korea. It's fought with the United States in almost every major international struggle. It is a long-time democracy, and, it's, a, and it's, it's one of the finest allies the United States has in the world who's taken risks and, and been there when we needed them. It helped us in Afghanistan. It helped us in Iraq and continues to do so in this hemisphere. Nonetheless, the struggles that we have together are still real and of great concern the efforts to resolve outstanding uh, uh, warfare and uh, violence are things that the United States has tried to uh, participate in positively, and it hasn't always been positive. And it also provides resources through things like the drug trade and others to criminal groups, corrupt groups, violent groups that have caused uh, horrible damage to Colombia. But the Colombian people have fought back. It was my pleasure to work with President Uribe, Jaime referred to when I was in the George W. Bush administration. And I used to tell him he was my second favorite president in the world. Um, uh, a brave man, um, a leading a brave people. And uh, it was always his position. We're going to do what's good for Colombia. We appreciate your help. But whether or not you help us, we're going to do what's good for Colombia. Um, there are not very many leaders in the world that we work with who have the skills and the tenacity or the people who rebuilt institutions under such devastation. I'm honored to be able to be a small part of this uh, program with the distinguished people here who represent the ongoing challenges which we can play a part on that's positive, but they will be the ones who, uh, who lead the future of Colombia in a much better direction. And as you hear them, you'll have greater optimism and confidence, and have greater reason to have us not get in the way, uh, which we have done in the recent past. So I will not take any more of their time, but welcome them and thank them for being part of uh, an effort to help your friends here understand how to be friends rather than uh, obstacles. Thank you all. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, thank you, Ambassador Darren Bloom, uh, Dr. Um, John Walters. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm going to present uh, uh, the, the keynote speaker today, uh, Congresswoman Maria Fernanda Cabal. Um, Maria Fernanda, whom I've known for, for many years, uh, she's a member of the party, the Centro Democratic Party, uh, and was elected in 2014 representing the city of Bogota at the Colombian National Congress. She's a strong politician. Uh, she's a leader who is known for her advocacy for criminal justice and enforcement of rule of law. Ms. Caval has been critical of the Havana Peace Accord, which in her view entitles impunity, uh, among others, to the members of FARC uh, at, at, uh, at this time. From 2006 to 2007, Ms. Caval was Director for International Affairs at the Colombian Attorney General's Office. She promoted the cooperation and the strengthening relations uh, with the U.S. Department of Justice. Throughout her career, Ms. Caval has worked with underserved communities in Colombia. Through the Cattle Foundation, she helped more than 3,000 peasants to develop their business. Her interest in different types and vulnerable groups led her to work directly with the Commissioner of the Colombian National Police, promoting relations between the San Cristobal District community in Bogota and the National Police. She also worked at the Colombian Homeland Department 
focused on programs of inclusion and empowerment for indigenous groups, women, civil ser servants, and the state of Amazon. She has traveled throughout Colombia to promote democratic practices and people's voting rights in urban communities, and she contributed to the creation of the National Voting Registers Office. Congresswoman Maria Fernanda Cabal graduated at the University of Los Andes in Bogota in political science. During her years at the university, she worked as a coordinator of the program for democracy, sponsored by the National Endowment for Democracy. As an international fellow um, sponsored by the Kettering Foundation, Ms. Cabal lived in Dayton, Ohio, and attended the National Issues Forum, a US-based nonpartisan nationwide network for civic education, which promotes and sponsors forums and training for public deliberation. I'm honored to present Maria Fernanda today. Dr. Jaime Darenblum, thank you to Dr. John Walters, and uh, this is the first time that I'm going to do this kind of speech in English. I, uh, of course, will do my best. I hope that uh, this effort of trying to summarize what I think is the most important, the most important inner things of the agreement could be here uh, explained to you. Uh, I have divided the final accord in all uh, the, the different um, issues that builds it. You can see political participation, the special jurisdiction for peace, the follow-up and verification committee, the victims, illegal drugs, and integral farming development policy. Among all those, um, what do you say, ejes? Axis. Among all those, the agreement was built. And here I want to present you in a, in a very objective way despite, of course, my membership to the Centro Democrático Álvaro Uribe's political party. Because as a Colombian citizen, I want to transmit to you all the concerns and worries that we're facing today. I will start with the Integral Farming Development Policy, or Integral Rural Reform. Because it is very important that you understand this as, as the strategy, is the starting point to understand the strategy of territorial control by one side. And also because you can also understand the way how FARC movement is getting into power because they are never, never forgetting their main objective which is that. Let's read the quote from uh, the opinion of alias Ivan Marquez, who is one of the uh, FARC leaders. He says, for FARC EP, the land concept is inextricably linked to the territory. They are an indivisible whole that goes beyond the purely agrarian aspect and touches strategic interests, vital of the whole nation. That's why the struggle for the territory is at the core of the struggles that are being waged in Colombia today. It is very important that you understand that FARC has justified its existence in a myth that we have called the founding myth. In that myth, they said that struggle for the land is the cause and the origin of all the conflict and violence in Colombia, which of course we do not agree and we are going to demonstrate this. 
In the 1930s, the Communist Party promoted the struggle for access to land as one of its main flags. That's why finally they got and they won the revolution in Cuba. Then they moved into Chile when Salvador Allende won the election, get into power. Then they moved into Mexico also, but in Mexico the elites were smart and they at that time it could control the momentum and I can say this revolutionary spirit and they institutionalize it through the PRI, Partido Revolucionario Institucional, and also this uh, revolutionary uh, um, fights get into Venezuela. Nobody knows that in the 60s, that's the real picture on the right side, the Cuban army were fighting against the Venezuelan army in Venezuelan field. And finally, we get into Colombia, as I have called it, the jewel in the crown, because of its geostrategical uh, uh, location in the map. In Colombia, and if you see all this propaganda, they are very smart enough that in the 30th, without any media, any internet, they have just one main marketing communication that they spread all over Latin America, which is the fight for the land, the fight for the poor, and all the arguments that, of course, in, in the times of Lenin and, and the starting of the Soviet Union Revolution, they use exactly the same. Even though they did not connect us today, they, were, they did were connected in the same objective. Colombia was penetrated by the Communist Party when they recruited the liberal guerrillas that at that time were fighting against the Conservative Party. And throughout the decade of the 60s and later the 80s, rural landowners were facing with blood and fire terrible invasions of their lands. Rural farmers were abducted, displaced, killed their families or the workers. We have made a search on that and we have all the facts and the sources that can explain to you how the Colombian state responded at that time. This was the motto, this was the propaganda, exactly the same as in the 30th, re they repeated in the 60s, and then again in the 80s. And basically is the land for he who toils, punishment for the tyrant. Yes, you can go furthermore. This chart is very important for you to understand what happened. The state of Colombia could not protect the land owners. They did what they think they had to do to calm and to came into peaceful again because they never knew that behind it was a communist strategy that were using poverty using the classes difference, and of course, using many problems that we have faced because we cannot forget that we were a Spanish colony, and as a Spanish colony, we have society difficult to face. For example, yes, in the past, it was landlords. In the past, it was a legislation named Ley de Mayorazgo, where the older children, a boy, was the only one who inherited the, the land. We had a society divided by racism because as a Spanish colony, the white people had the privilege over the mulatos, the mestizos, and the blacks. But it does not exist anymore as they try to show everyone, especially with the land. If you see a back, get, get into the back a little bit, yes. 
or what you see in the left side is all the legislation that year by year the state of Colombia did to solve the problem of the arguments that the FARC and the other groups say, that there were peasants without lands and that the land was concentrated. Since the 1961, then in 1968, in 73, in 75, in 82, in 88, then in 1994, and finally in 2003. The land grant, what you see in the first uh, chart that says that during the last 55 years, the Colombian state bought the land for a very low price, mostly to those land owners that were invaded, that were suffering violence, they bought it 1,749,000 hectares, and they were distributed among the invaders. Also, they transferred the unused lands that belong to the state. They transferred 19,500,000 hectares. But also, they transferred to indigenous people and black people 30,800,000. All these sources are institutional sources. I did not invent any of these numbers. This is for real. Let's move on. What was very curious is that most of the invaders that violently invaded the lands in years six, decades of the 60s, about 68, and then in the 80s, especially from the 87 to the 94, they sold it. 95% sold what they received. What do you prove with that? First, that the whole tenants of the land does not warranty an improving of your level of living. Second, that most of these invaders didn't have an agricultural vocation. Third, many of them belong to what is called Frentes Populares de la Guerrilla. In English, could be Popular Fronts. It's a way of combining the fighting, the different ways how they fight. This is the reality today. The reality is that private property is 45 million hectares. Government property is 18 million. Natural protector areas are 12 million. Indigenous reservations or resguardos indígenas are 31 million. And black communities, 5 million. So tell me where is the concentration in the hands of the landlords? That's a big lie. And today, government of Juan Manuel Santos is repeating the same lie. Adelante. If we, if we um, take the same chart that I have already read to you, and if we expand it and we add the category or the indicador of, how do you say it? Indicator of real straight registration. You could see that private property of 45 million hectares have 4,531,000 uh, titles, registration. It come to an average of 10 hectares. If you go to the government property, and you add it to natural protected areas. It means 18 million plus 12 million, which is uh, 30 million hectares. And you divide it in the records of the registry office, that is 118,000. You will get a promedy, an average of 264. And finally, if you get the indigenous reservation plus the black communities, which come to be 36 million, divided in 11,353 title, titles, it will be 3,200 hectares in the average. So what they have told us is not the truth. What happened now? With these rural 
reform in the agreement, the government are taking the same recipe as they have been doing in all the past years that I show you on the chart, but in a more aggressive way against the rural uh, landowners. Why? When I speak to the rural people, even to the peasants, they told us sometimes it's better in Colombia to be a guerrillero or to be a paramilitar than having taken a risk of buying a land because there's any more, any judicial warranty for the rural property when you are hit by this kind of false premises and this kind of, of policies that are very easy to sell everywhere, of course. Land for the poor, because the landlords are the ones who are concentrating the land. And that's not the truth. We are very worried, because now what they're doing is that they are going to confiscate property, or they are going to extinguish the domain, because if you don't, accomplish with the social function of the land that has been established in legislation before, but not as an aggressive as today. And if you don't take care of environment, they will uh, take your property. And the same people who are going to visit your property belong to the same agency, the land agency, that are going to say if you're doing it right or not. Why the citizens have to suffer always a prosecution of public officers that doesn't even know how to grow anything, that doesn't even know how a peasant or a landowner has is, is their way of living or their business. That's what we are facing now and we are very worried because I want that you see the maps that I will be showing to you for giving a more clear explanation. Yes, let's go to the maps. Yes. In Venezuela, the National Institute of Lands or the agency do the same. Like we are copying the Venezuelan model of the uh, Agencia, el Instituto Nacional de Tierras, with the Agencia Nacional de Tierras. Here you could see in this map the presence of FARC in the Colombian territory. Then let's continue with the location map of the, here are the uh, drug crops and illegal mining. Yes, go ahead. Here, let's see what we have. We have the temporary pathway zones created by the agreement where it's supposed that the, the mobilized FARC members would be um, uh, integrated or will be concentrated. Yes. The name is like transient pathway zones of normalization. The government told us that this was going to be just temporary. But they lied to us. Now they are permanent. And these are one of our worries. Look where they are located. In the same areas of the traditional control of FARC, of coke, crops, heroin, uh, amapola, uh, puppy, puppy crops, and also a illegal minery. How can a military allow that. I cannot understand it. If we know that the territorial control is part of the strategies of controlling the country. These are the drug trafficking routes. So, in this moment, it brings us to the point of the agreement. If you go to the first uh, chart, the first in the hell. Ah, okay, no. There's no, okay, that, don't, don't do it then. Uh, we have to get into the illicit drug agreement. So, always, 
the Communist Party has promoted the struggle for the land on one, or as one of its flags. Always. There's always the same marketing material for them to gain uh, uh, favors, to gain uh, allies. But you know now how the maps are. And these maps are also monitored because the United Nations and the DA monitor uh, the crops, the illegal drug crops. Here, what is happening? Ivan Marquez says, we are not drug traffickers and we do not have money. That's what he says. And the government simply agreed and not just believing him on what he said, but with the formula that any guerrilla member that have been trafficking with drugs will be granted with amnesty because they consider that the crime of trafficking with drugs would be a crime connected with rebellion, with a political crime, because they argued that they need money to fight against the state. They need money for the revolution. That's why they had to traffic with illicit drugs. One time I asked them, and they never answered me, members of the government, and money from abductions. That's not a crime of uh, lesa humanidad. It is. So they, today, are granted with amnesty. Today, all their criminal records of trafficking drugs are related with politics, with rebellion. But now, also, they are awarded of not being extradited. So government has given everything to them, everything. Also, at that time, it is, it is good to uh, point out that government also cancels the, um, how do you say, fumigación? Eradication. Eradication, but with glyphosate. When it was aspersion with the, in the air with the planes, they said, no, not anymore, because it destroys the environment. Like the, if the coke uh, crops did not destroy the environment. So they said they destroy the environment, and they obey for manual eradication. But this started with an unconfirmed study from the Health World Organization and because of our health minister that irresponsibly say that the glyphosate produces cancer. But in the same study, it says that the hairdressing produces cancer. And it is amazing. But in the Council on Public, uh, in the Council on, on Criminal Policy, the only voice who raised against that decision was the Procurador General. His name is Alejandro Ordonez, the only one. The rest of the members, the ministers, they just followed what the orders of President Santos was. It was using an unconfirmed study to say we cannot use glyphosate through the planes anymore. So, also, if you see here, let's get a little bit in the back, to the back, a little bit, yes, more, yes. Manual eradication, not for not destroying the environment. Okay, yes, we could agree with that, but they had to ask the councils and assemblies in the communities to decide how it is going to be made, how the crops are going to be replaced. So there is no more authority from any official, any officer of the state, anyone, except dealing with communities that we all know that are coca growers, and behind them are different illegal groups. 
What happened today? Let's get forward. There are clashes every day, especially in three regions. Catatumbo, which is in the frontier with Venezuela. The south of Colombia, which is Cauca, in the north part of Cauca. And Tumaco, which is in the Pacific. Every day, clashes from coke growers against the public force. Six people have died during the last six months. It is completely uncontrolled. And afterwards, what we have now, 190,000 hectares, the biggest coke uh, crop in history because of all what they have given to FARC for signing this peace agreement. Yes. Okay. The reports of the DEA, the reports of the United Nations, the awareness of Mr. Brownfield that three months ago he went to Colombia. He was a former ambassador. Now I think he just resigned as a SAR, an anti-drug SAR. But he say, hey, be careful what you're doing. We also get the a warn of a Barry McCaffrey, who was the former SAR anti-drug and the mastermind of the Plan Colombia, who served very well during the time, uh, the first was Pastrana and then with Alvaro Uribe. Finally, we received a communication from President Donald Trump telling Colombia that they should be or they could be decertified if we are not efficient in the fighting to stop the growth of drug tra trafficking. In the same sense, we had the pronounce of a senator, Diane Feinstein, and in the same address, in the same precinct where Diane Feinstein was uh, saying that uh, about ending the Plan Colombia. We got the study of the specialist Douglas Farah that says that there is a big money laundering through PDVSA, the oil company from Venezuela, and also linking that with two institutions, two enterprises in Salvador and in Nicaragua. It's a triangle, PDVSA, Salvador, Nicaragua, where he has found about $2,000 million money laundered from FARC. The relations between Colombia and the United States have suffered several moments of tensions. For example, this guy. The name of this guy is alias Nader. I think you say here AKA? The nickname AKA Nader. Okay. This guy has been accused of kidnapping an American citizen in Panama. He was released because of the amnesty. Afterwards, the American ambassador wrote a letter, a strong letter, to the, just, to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court answered him angrily, saying, hey, this is our internal decisions. Anyone can, um, can press us because of it. But just a few days later, go ahead, this guy, few days later, named Alexander Romero, was infiltrated in the lists that the FARC make with the government of people who belong to the list, FARC list. So if you belong to a FARC list, you won't be extradited. You will be granted with amnesty. If you traffic a drugs, you will be considered as a rebel. It's the same. It's a crime connected. So this guy, Alexander Romero, a hitman, big, big, powerful man with a group that, ki that um, is hired for killing, was inside that list. Then a big scandal in Colombia. They said, oh, no, it's not one. It's 25. And afterwards, the Attorney General of Colombia says, it's not 25, 
there are about 400 in the list. And we get also, again, the awareness of the ambassador that says, we follow cases of people who offer $5 million to enter the list of the FARC to avoid extradition. But of course, they are criminals. They are, gonna cha they are not going to change their behavior because of all these, um, how do you say, premiums? The rewards that the government has given them. When you're a criminal and you get a reward, you get worst. You're not punished for all what you have done. Afterwards, what happened then? All this is in the last month. Last month, last two months. Okay, ahead. This guy, Rodrigo Cadete, was the second from the ring leader alias Mono Jojoy. Mono Jojoy is the one very powerful who had all these military and policemen in jail like, like, a, like a concentration camp. It was, you can see the images of, of when, he wa and when he went to visit them. They were like, like como un gallinero, Gabriela. <laughs> Horrible. It was one of the worst scenes that we had. This guy is the second one. This guy is the guy who had all the information of the money who is hidden. He apparently demobilized. He was granted with all these awards, but then he got bored and he escaped. And he escaped to run the biggest movement that is called the FARC dissidences. So what we have now? 700 non-demobilized FARC members, supposedly dropouts or dissenters. 4,000 ELN members, a group that was almost disappeared in the time of President Uribe. ELN in territories that they were never been before. People said that they had a deal with FARC to rent territories. The FARC left some territories and that's are occupied by ELN, and the same, the Bakrim. Who is the Bakrim? 6,000 people. People from the paramilitares or people from the guerrilla. Their main goal, trafficking drugs. How can you build peace with 190,000 hectares of coke? That's the gasoline for every war. That's our karma in our history. We have been facing that, and we know that even though the problem is not going to be solved, solved in this human community because there's always somebody who, who, who uses it and there's always somebody who, who grows it, you have to have a policy to control. Otherwise, you will not have a state anymore. Or you will have a failed state that Venezuela which is a narcotic state. That's, that's, that's our worries. Also, the Colombian government and the United Nations declared that FARC had delivered 8,370 weapons during the mobilization. That's too low. If they were from eight to 10,000 demobilized, the experts in the army says that usually one guerrillero carries in his body from four to five weapons. Here, with these numbers, it's like they have just one. Also, the missiles, Earth-to-air Earth missiles, they did not return anything of that. What happened with the, the uh, fusiles, with the weapons, that were dropped by Montesinos? The guy from Peru, you remember him. He dropped in Colombia, I don't know, it was around 5,000, 6,000. What happened to that? Every day, the army uncovers a new hidden weapon place. But what happened? There's any punishment for FARC today. There's no limits. Anything. If we get all these to the victim 
a part of the agreement, you will remember that President Santos always says that the victims were the center of the negotiation of the agreement. False. That is not true. The guerrilla members are not going to pay any day in prison. They said we were the liars because we won with the no in the plebiscite. Any single day because they are using a concept that is restorative justice. That for me is just makeup. Any single day in jail of punishment, but also they're going to be immediately, automatically in Congress. Five seats in the Senate, five seats in the House. About the victims, as I told you, the recruited children were not returned. The Attorney General Office says that since seven, it was 1975 up to 2014, there was about 11,500 children abducted. Then the FARC members, especially Mr. Ivan Marquez, the one who says that they are not drug traffickers and that they are poor, said they just had 20, they said 21 children under the age of 15, 21. Finally, with a big pressure, they returned 112. And I have my own experience with, with one of those children because the mother was walking around and found one of our senators in the Llanos of Colombia near uh, Villavicencio, in the region, in the, the plain region. And she was begging for somebody who helped her to find his children that three years ago was taken by FARC. And she has a picture. And my friend, that she's from the Senate, Nora Tovar, she shows a picture in the Twitter. The picture was for a boy for about 12 or 13 years old. And we were promoting this in the network, in the Twitter. Finally, when the demobilized get in the concentration zones, the boy took a picture with her girlfriend. But of course, you see a boy at the age of 12 and the boy at the age of 16, and there is much difference because the body has grown. He has now different features, but her mother identified him and said, that's my boy. You cannot imagine. All what we have done, we, Congress people, that you could think we're powerful people, trying to press the High Commissioner of Peace to return this, this boy. It's awful. The FARC didn't want to return the children. So we get marched, we went there, we keep pressing and pressing. Finally, they allowed one media TV to get there, but that media TV was uh, controlled by them. So every answer that they were asked for the children was monitored by them. Are you happy here? Yes, yes, I'm happy here. Do you want to leave? No, maybe. I want to see my mother, but I don't want to leave. Finally, he escaped. And we could protect him. But the family had to move because they were going to be killed. How can you trust in an agreement that doesn't uh, fit the elementary basis of building confidence. It's very hard because we live it day by day. It's not just for being, ah, oh, President Uribe, you love the war. Oh, you are extremely right uh, side. No, it's just common sense of a civilized society that wants to live in peace and not in impunity, not awarding criminals. Finally, you see that they didn't return the kidnapped people. There is a very important organization that belongs to a journalist named Ervin Hoyos. The organization is a victim organization. He had a program, I don't know if you know, Gabriela, that he had a program, it says, Las Voces del Secuestro. 
the abducted voices. It starts at midnight, and during, you know, the midnight until 5 o'clock in the morning, he invited me twice. And the people who was abducted when they were uh, uh, liberated, they remember the program because that was the only connection to the other world. So their parents went there, their family, their children. So they get a little support with a program that doesn't exist anymore because it was canceled by the channel, by pressers of President Santos. He doesn't have it anymore. But he has a very strong organization, and he says more than 400 did not return. Of course, they're dead. They cannot keep these people alive. They're dead. And finally, what caused really anger in people was the list of assets. In the list of assets, the FARC members, they put orange squeezers, they put mops, they put genital surgeries, uh, they put 136 cattle, when we know that people like alias El Paisa has more than 20,000 cattle. El Mono Jojoy was the biggest, biggest farmer in Colombia. Biggest. Like a kingpin. Like what they are. So they make fun of it. And people is not comfortable with it. This list was for reasons for helping the victims? Yes. In the point of the victims, they agreed that they're going to repair victims. How do you repair victims? By returning what you get from kidnapping, from, from coke, from, from everything what you have. And they did a list. But the list did not include um, the people who works for them, did not include the figureheads. It does not include assets in Colombia and internationally. However, the Attorney General has information of many assets that has been forfeited in different countries. For example, if you go ahead, this guy said to be fire figurehead claims money. He said, oh no, I'm, 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 the money fell from the, he said, that's true, from heaven. Because of course, the money gets in a, in a aircraft. He was caught with $3 million in cash and assets. And this is a second one. This guy from FARC, money launderers, figurehead, has $17 million. None of that is on the list. But nothing happens. There's no limits. There's no punishment. So they keep going on. But the most serious about all of what happened with the victims, with the lease, with the, the figureheads, is go furthermore. This decree. With this decree, the government does not extinct the domain of goods, which is mandatory. When you get, when you uh, get assets, from criminal background, the criminal lost the property of it. But to get it into the state property, there is a legal figure which is the only one who fits exactly, which is extin extinction of domain. No, the government did not extinct the domain. They are just going to administrate assets that are the product of a crime. All this is in discussion and the debate today. We don't understand what is the play role behind, really. We don't understand what is behind. And if we continue all of this with the political reform that, as I told you, there are going to be five seats in Senate, five seats in the House. They agreed also to have 16 seats, 16 as special constituencies of peace, because peace is an obsession for criminals that kills people and children every day. It's, it's, it's something that they have in their, 
in their weird behavior, peace, 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 but they are the killers. And they are going to teach us how to live in peace. These 16 electorate uh, um, peace um, constituencies are located in 168 municipalities. Let's see where are they located in the map. Let's remember the maps that we showed you before. Uh-huh, yes. And let's put the map. Okay. It fits perfectly with the coke regions. It fits perfectly with the illegal minority. It fits perfectly with the zones concentrated for the verification of the process. Who is going to gain those seats? Because they say, hey, you are lying. The political parties are not going to be allowed to participate. So far, political parties are not. Hi. Of course, they are going to do it through their social organization, to the social movements, to the cocaine crop, to the coal crop uh, associations. These seas will be for them. This is territorial control. They got what we wanted since 55 years up to today. The agreement gave them what they did not get. Never. Never would have get that, but they get it with the agreement. They are going to be granted with 600,000, the money, the budget, for helping his political party because they are poor. And they are going to get 600,000 also to promote their think tank. It means the communist ideology that have killed more than 200,000 Colombian people is going to be granted with our taxes for them to promote communism. It sounds crazy, really. And I have to face this every day in Congress. And I really cannot understand who is going to stop this craziness that are going to ruin the Republican institutions that we had since 200 years ago that have many problems. Because we have corruption, we have lack of democracy, everything. But at least we have freedom. But we are very close to lose it. And finally, let's get into the two last points that were very short to the end. Special jurisdiction for peace. Why they didn't build a tribunal for the FARC, who is the people, who is the mobilizing, and also get the military who committed crimes in a tribunal that fits also to their career. No. The same tribunal for the same. They put in the equal position the guerrilla members, the terrorists, with the army. But also, they include the civilians. Why they did that? Because for revolutionary mentality, they take the reality upside down. The good are bad, the bad are good. So they said, we are not victimaries. We are not criminals. We are victims. We are victims of the state. We are victims of all of you. All of you made us to do what we did. So all of you have to be in the same tribunal with us. But why also I didn't like that this tribunal is not inserted in the, uh, how do you say, Estado de Derecho? In the, in the rule of law. The structure that we have built, the judiciary system, this is a tribunal completely apart. It's a para tribunal. It doesn't fit behind a closing court that could be the Supreme Court or could be the Constitutional Court. No. But also, it does not repair. It does not respect at least one of the tools that our system has gained, which is the tutela. That is like a garden, guardianship. When you feel that your fundamental rights are affected, you use that tool. It changes the way that you can use the tool, which is impossible to get. Why they did that? What is the purpose? 
the purpose is prosecuting all of us because we don't think like them. It is very dangerous when you have a tribunal in countries that does not respect the opposition, that does not respect even freedom of speech in some times, or that you feel that you don't have judicial warranties. And for ending, also, he is a professor, American University, many classes, and I know many human rights activists love him and love another guys like him. I don't. He's openly Marxist. He helped with amnesty guerrilleros from Sendero Luminoso in Peru. He has been very questioned. But also, also, he has written sentences against Colombia as a member of the International uh, Court, Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights. How come he now take the position of choosing who will be the judges for that jurisdiction? For me, is not neutral. It has an agenda. Justice cannot have an agenda anymore because it has destroyed our country. And this is to end the presentation. Uh, the last uh, surprise. This commission, as you see it there, is like an appendix. That appendix means that this commission integrated with three members of the FARC, look what kind of members of the FARC, and three members of the, con of the government, and they decide every government act, every project of legislation, every act that reforms our constitution, they decide who passes and who does not pass through the Congress, where I'm a member, because they need to take care of the spirit of the agreement. Who gave those guys the power to do that if they also lost the plebiscite? Now we have to suffer them for the next 10 years. They are going to control everything. If I want to promote a business from agricultural and industrial entrepreneurs and peasants, if we're going to build that, they could say no. We're not interested in that. Maybe it damages the spirit of the accord. See? Ah, I don't know the or plebiscito. Okay. Ah? Referen uh, referendum is one figure and plebiscite is another. The plebiscite, you said yes or no. The referendum, they, quest they make many questions or four or three questions. But basically, what I'm telling you is that these, these decisions made by this commission destroys it does not protect the spirit of the agreement. It destroyed the functionality of the Congress. We are not independent anymore because this filter is mandatory. When I talk about the plebiscito, it's because President Santos, thinking that they have the love of his people, like all the crazy people that they, everybody loves him, like Maduro, that has a minister of the happiness, no? to make all us, all us happy. He called the electorate to vote. And we voted no, and we won. But they didn't care. They didn't respect the, how do you say, soberanía popular? Popular sovereignty. They did it like a twisted figure in Congress where the Congress that they have from the majority, that they, uh, they work with Santos, they do what Santos wants, they presented the proposition, 
and usually I present a proposition uh, to help the uh, migrants for Venezuela. I present propositions are different things, but propositions are not jumping over the results of the plebiscite, but they did it. They did not make the change that we wanted, because we do want peace, but not this kind of what they are thinking it is peace is going to destroy our institutions. We will not have democracy anymore with the implementation of this agreement. Yeah, and Cuba and Venezuela? When they do not uh, get consensus, the three and the three, when they do not reach uh, agreement. agreement, the countries that are going to, uh, to, to, to define is Cuba and Venezuela. So I hope I was clear enough. Uh, the, the, uh, this writing, this lecture, it's on, the, on your website. This presentation, you can see inside every source that I use if you want to get deeper inside, it's not a subjective because I am from this side or I don't like the guerrilla or I don't like Santos. This is because it's my country and I'm truly, truly scared of what is the future that we are going to get. Thank you very much. bit on uh, what um, Congresswoman Maria Fernanda has said and based on the Venezuelan side. And everything starts at the border. We have a large border, 2,200-kilometer uh, border uh, running between Colombia and Venezuela that has a very volatile history and erratic uh, trade flow. So if we look back almost 30 years ago, we can appreciate the evolution into that trade of both countries. And I think trade gives, will give you an idea where, we're, where we were before and where we're heading right now. In terms of the legal trade uh, of goods, the bilateral trade in 1988, which was the time, I use 1988 because it was the time where the opening of the economies in Latin America was going on, the trade, the bilateral trade was uh, $328 million between Colombia and Venezuela. Five, year later, five years later, after the opening uh, of the economy in Colombia, in Venezuela, Mexico, um, it was at the time, uh, the trade jumped uh, four times to one billion three hundred and eighty million uh, um, dollars. Then um, five years later, when Chavez came in, the bilateral trade had reached uh, uh, a little bit of a two point uh, one billion uh, U.S. dollars. And then ten years after, uh, it jumped. It had jumped already to seven billion dollars, of which. Six billion was from Colombia to Venezuela, and 1.2 was from Venezuela to Colombia. At that moment, 2009, we had problems with the border. The border was shut down, and eight years later, as of last year, trade, legal trade between both countries, went down to 800 million dollars. So from 7 billion to 800 in six years. So why do I say this? Because as we were having uh, the increase and then the decrease of trade between Colombia and Venezuela, um, the erratic, um, um, the erratic uh, um, flow of that, uh, of that trade, we could see how the illicit trade, the illegal trade was growing. And this is where it goes into Maria Fernanda's uh, presentation. In 2009, Chavez closed the border and they cut abruptly the bilateral trade. The, the reason was because Colombia had agreed to allow U.S. troops more access to the military bases as part of the uh, Plan Colombia and, and the aid package to fight drug traffickers. So that's when Chavez decided to uh, close the border. Um, until then, that really affected the Colombia, uh, the Colombian business because they, after the United States, uh, it was the second partner um, in trade, Colombia with Venezuela, and this decision led to a, 
a drop of 70% of exports from Colombia to Venezuela. So as that legal trade was shrinking, the illicit trade was flourishing, mainly in uh, derivatives of petroleum, cocaine, cattle, and other commercial goods. So a new business uh, model emerged as the other one disappeared, a new one emerged, which was the military, uh, Venezuelan military associated with the Colombia guerrillas, which is the new mafia that now controls the Venezuelan border inland Venezuela, inland Colombia. So according to the Colombian National Police, as of today, there are 247 bypass or dirt road shortcuts along the border that serves this illicit trade. And this goes along with a map that she was showing of those areas chosen by the guerrillas on the Colombian side that's going to be the peace uh, jurisdictions. Um, these contraband routes are in those uh, three states, Guajira, Norte Santander, and Arauca, exactly in the states where you have these peace zones. Both sources of both countries, they uh, estimate that 10% of the fossil fuels consumed in Colombia, gasoline, paraffin, kerosene, they come from contraband from Venezuela. PDVSA says, for whatever it's worth, that uh, the equivalent of 100,000 barrels a day of oil, but in, in petroleum derivatives, is shipped illegally every day from, Colum from Venezuela to Colombia. So while that extraction of gasoline from Venezuela uh, to Colombia is highly lucrative business, in Venezuela it creates shortages. And I'll just give you an example. The sale price of a liter of gasoline today in Venezuela is, and I don't even know how to say this, 0.01 US dollars, less than a cent. While in Colombia, the average of the sale price of a liter is almost a dollar, 75 cents. So if you look at the math, and if it doesn't play a trick on me, the difference could be or is around uh, almost 8,000% of, of difference, what would be profit. So depending on the sales location, that sale price could go higher, and the difference could be around 11,000%. Uh, this uh, contraband gasoline in Colombia has uh, 1,300 sale points throughout the, the region, especially in the border. And as I said, this is something uh, where the it's a very lucrative business where FARC and the Colombia and the Venezuelan military are associated. Um, the second business uh, in the frontier, of course, is uh, is the uh, the drug business. Um, in the Venezuelan side is the high and middle rank military, the Bolivarian Army and the Bolivarian National Guard that not only control the gasoline, uh, but also uh, they are, uh, support all the drug business. Um, it's estimated today that um, this association of government officials and uh, Venezuelan government officials, Venezuelan militaries, and uh, FARC, um, and uh, ELN, they manage approximately uh, the distribution of 350 tons of cocaine from Colombia shipping uh, to Venezuela and then from there to the U.S. and Europe. So, uh, and also the, the Bacrims, the Urabeños, and Rastrojos, they also participate. So this is a large conglomerate of illegal actors uh, in the business of not only gasoline, but of course uh, drugs. Um, Finalco, which is also it's a, a Colombian Association of Consumer Business, estimates that at least 90% of the population in Cúcuta, which is a medium-sized city bordering Venezuela, buys contraband goods from Venezuela. So basically, Cúcuta lives on that illegal business. And also, they believe the statistics that they show is that 50% of the population in, in Cúcuta is involved directly or indirectly into uh, the uh, contraband business of gasoline and consumer goods. The consumer goods in Venezuela are subsidized uh, by the government, and the little that there is, uh, the people, the, the mafias, they buy it and resell it in Colombia at a large, large process. So, and the last point that I wanted to make here is that, um, as you remember, FARC and ELN have established themselves in Venezuela. Um, in various uh, middle-sized uh, cities in the western side of our country bordering with Colombia. 
They are the support system of the drug business and other illegal activities. As you recall, seven years ago, the Colombian ambassador to the OAS charged that Venezuela provided a safe haven for 1,500 FARC members and ELN who operated in 87 camps, um, and that at the time, Chavez provided top FARC commanders material support. But this was seven years ago. This year, the governor of state of Amazonas in Venezuela denounced a present of 40,000 uh, 40, uh, guerrilla members in the Venezuelan territory. So if you see what's happening in Colombia, that what Maria Fernanda explained to us, and then you see what's happening in Venezuela, you see uh, somehow a coordination uh, into what's happening in, in, in both countries. And I don't think it's a coincidence. On top of that, another common denominator is Cuba which is a non-democratic actor and prom which promote peace while plotting really a power grab. According to the OAS Secretary General, there are 15,000 Cubans living in Venezuela involved in supporting the Maduro regime. We also know that there are Hezbollah cells in the Margarita Island in Venezuela, uh, and Vice President Alzami has close links with this terrorist group. I want to quote uh, from last August 13, a month ago, uh, CIA Director uh, Mike Pompeo, he said in the news and mainstream media that Venezuela could become a risk to the U.S. if chaos continues to roil in South America. The Cubans are there, the Russians are there, the Iranians are there, Hezbollah is there. This is something that has a risk of getting to a very, very bad place. So America need, needs to take this very seriously. That's exactly, I'm quoting exactly what he said. On the other hand, there are two reports, one by uh, Associated Press Agency and the other one by the American Enterprise Institute. Both of them highlight Iran's business interest in Venezuela. Having invested in a bicycle manufacturing facility in the eastern side of Venezuela, a tuna processing factory, and the mining mining uh, of gold and uranium in the Roraima Basin, which is close to Guyana. Back in 2015, uh, the, an Israeli intelligence source also reported the same thing, that Venezuela and Bolivia were supplying uranium to Iran for its nuclear program. And then another study, according to, to uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Venezuela has an estimate of 50 thousand tons of untapped uranium reserves. So all this you put together and you see the ideological and political and business affinities between Venezuela, uh, fascist, uh, fascist government and socialist regime, and the Colombian uh, communist uh, guerrillas. And you see how this is building up uh, to a real security threat for democratic uh, democracy, not only in Venezuela, in Colombia, but for the region. Uh, and this is without going into the interest of Russia and China and Venezuela. So the question is, uh, our frontier, would it become the seed of a new narco nation? It would be a safe haven for illicit business to consolidate that. Uh, last quote I want to say is William Brownfield. He recently said, we will not see a democratic system in Venezuela, democracy recovered in Venezuela, as long as the uh, narco traffic dominates the government and the whole country. That's basically my quotes for thank you for We're going to start now to exchange questions and answers. Let's begin in a very orderly way, and this is very democratic. I pick who. Who was? <laughs> um, the gentleman in the back. Hi, good afternoon. Alex Sanchez. I'm a defense analyst. I have a question for the congresswoman. One issue that you did not talk about is humanitarian demining, the desminado humanitario. Uh, around about 11,000 people, mostly a lot of them civilians, have been injured or killed because of the mines, the explosives that the FARC and the ELN you know, have placed across the countryside. I know that the government is trying to get rid of all the mines by 2021, you know, by four, in four years. Do you think this is achievable? And are the FARC guerrillas helping the Colombian army to locate the mines, the explosives, to you know, get rid of them? Thank you. Yes, we are aware that there are different programs, in fact, within a region government of uh, 
there's me now. Okay, mining. The mining. The mining. But the problem is that we, if, if you still have 700 people that are going to increase their numbers because of the cocaine capacity of, of uh, corrupt or getting demobilized people. If you have now 700 in, in the desertions that now has a new group, and also you have the ELN who are expertise in uh, putting mines. I don't know how all these efforts are going to end and really are going to finally clean Colombia as what it did in other countries, like in, in African countries, for example. I, I, I think there was the biggest mining field in an African country and we were the second. So the efforts, yes, we need to recognize that there are efforts made on that way. The problem is that we are trying to solve something, keeping the business where they get tons of millions of dollars to keep fighting, either with the desertions, the new members of the FARC, or the, how, how do they call that? So las disidencias, dissidences, Dissidents. or either with the ELN, which has been growing. That's our main problem. So it's not going to be solved soon. Okay. There's a mic. She's there. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jose Cadenas. I'm a consultant here in Washington, uh, Hijo de Colombia. Uh, Congresswoman, the Colombia is going into a presidential election next year. To what ex uh, obviously, the peace plan, the peace process, will be a an important issue in in that campaign. How? But how? Are, do you expect that there's going to be candidates uh, who will advocate repealing the peace agreement, or modifying it, or? accepting it and making the best out of a bad situation? Yes, the opportunity for candidates is to show their proposals. I think there will be some that will say, hey, let's take this away, of course. I think there are another ones that will say, keep it, but you have to modify it, because the way it is, is not possible. It's not possible 7,000 the mobilized member of FARC changed the living of 48 million Colombians, especially when we won with the plebiscite. And there will be, of course, people who are going to have the flag that you, we have to keep the peace. We have to keep the peace. Candidates use their propaganda in the easiest way. The matter is that people in Colombia are very distrustful now because this kind of news raised every day. You know that I couldn't update my writing because every single day in Colombia is a new worst after the other. Now, you know what they're facing now? There is a big struggle since yesterday in the Congress. Uh, people that follows the party of the Vice President, Herman Bar, the former Vice President, that was with Santos seven years. Now he's getting uh, outside from the Santos the consequences of its policies. Now he said, no, 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 I don't like this. But in seven years, he did not say that. But because he's a candidate now, he's saying, I don't want the ju special jurisdiction for peace. Especially because yesterday the the judges were uh, appointed and the judges appointed there are several that let me tell you are openly Marxist and openly helpful with guerrilla and openly belonging to NGOs that in the past have defended the guerrilla you cannot build the process with this kind of strategy it's very it's muy, how do you say that it's it's, uh, for, it's torpe it's, 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 it's dumb. 
It's it, because they because they are accustomed to make excess with everything. So they don't care, but they should care because people in Colombia is not trusting. So you will have the whole range of candidates, of course, and the whole propaganda. But let me tell you, it's very hard to sell this peace agreement today in Colombia. Even though the leftist and the guy who follow Santos, they have to have a, a different way on selling their candidates. Otherwise, they won't get it, even though with the money from FARC, that we fear that, even though. But the first, the best example is the vice president that now is saying, I'm not going. And the, his party went out of the election yesterday, so they couldn't pass it. And of course, we added, because we are never with the government, exceptionally. So now they are facing difficulties to pass the jurisdiction, the special jurisdiction, the regulamentary of the special jurisdiction for peace. So now it will be very hard for government to implement all what they want because there is a struggle for presidency. Hmm. Yes. Um, so thank you so much for coming. My name is Manuela Hernandez. Um, I'm a Colombian American citizen, um, and I'm really intrigued by the presentation that you gave. I want to ask about the implementation process for the alternative crops for the rural farmers and how that process has been implemented so far. I know it's a 10-year 10, 10 implementation process, but I was wondering if you can talk about how that process has moved forward, if you have seen any um, re restitution of, of land right? I mean, you've talked briefly about it, but how that's been um, moved to the forefront, because that was one of the main reasons for the conflict in the first place, is the, the rural farmers who weren't really being acknowledged by the government, and if that problem has been moved forward since. And the second question is the progress on the ELN peace talks, and how has that progressed? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have not been following how successful has been the replacement of crops, but let me tell you, that there are some experiences, and I think you had a very nice experience in the Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta, in the time of President Uribe. It is efficient, and it works, just when you get all the state institutions working together, and they grant also more international money, and they have common sense. And usually, uh, public officials do not not have that. The problem is that they raise a public policy. Let's change the crop from coke to cacao. Yes, to coffee. But they never get the market. They never get the price. They never get the security for the people to do that. So the problem is always on how the state has itself the way to implement it as an entrepreneurial who take care of its business. So today, of course, there are peasants that want to change coke for another because it's, it's curious. But usually, the coke uh, growers' family never raise their level of living. It's something that is very surprising because they get much more money but that money does not uh, increase their level of living. Instead, it destroys it, the family. Because in that areas, you have many money, so you have prostitution, uh, you have the consume of drugs. So all the rest of the bad things of society gets in there. And because they are paid daily, they don't save. So their living is very bad, even though they get more money. Also, there is another problem in that region. Many of them are obey to cultivate, to grow it. If they don't do it, they have to be displaced because they will be killed. I find many people in Bogota displaced because they did not want to grow for an illegal group. Either FARC, ELN, Bakrim, paramilitares, the kingpin. They don't. So again, we face the same problem, security. If you have a place secure, that you're not going to be killed or displaced, that the changing of what you're growing 
will have a market, well, you can survive, of course it will be absolutely successful. But for today, for example, there are 200 families protesting in Caquetá. Why? They were promoted to eradicate manually, and now they have not received the money from government to change their crops. Always. It's bureaucracy, incapacity of the state to solve problems that, yes, it could be solved and the community could live better. Very good. Uh, another question, final question. My name is Yusar, I'm an intern with Brookings, and I was wondering about the reintegration process and the success of that. Uh, has there been any success? How well are these people reintegrating after they've left FARC? The integration yeah. process. Uh, you know, it, it is very interesting to get deeper in, not in the whole big issue that I, just, just to have like the own overview, but then when you get into the issues that you really concern is it's it's better to understand how to solve these problems. Uh, when you three days ago, I read an article that you should read. I don't know if they write in English, but it's in the portal the la portal es la silla vacía, the empty seat, right? Uh, I don't usually, okay, it, they have good and bad articles, but this is very good. Website. Website, yes. Mm -hmm. This is really good. This is journalists, young, like you, that have gone to the different concentrational areas, and they have written what is happening in each one. And it's extremely interesting because it did impress me, and let me tell you, I have worked with FARC, uh, the mobilized people. The people who really taught me how to understand war inside was Spark, not the army. <laughs> they did taught, taught us on how to understand how people is organized. And if you read that portal, you will see what is happening. The main problem is that, again, government is failing on what they promised. You get the young people concentrated, but because they don't have weapons in the concentration camp. They lost the hierarchy. They lost the, how do you say, el mando. The command. the command is not anymore. The commanders are away. Most of them are in Bogota, dealing, or in Cuba, or, you know. So they are in a kind of freedom, relative freedom, where they don't do anything in the morning because they don't have somebody with a weapon besides say, hey, you have to do that. They are like the perfect uh, people that waste their time. So many of them have run away to the other groups or many wanted to go to their families because they want to live a life of a normal person. They said, we have the database of the people who has left. I'm absolutely sure that if you rebuild your life with your family, you don't want to come anymore. So what you see is that they are disintegrating. I know that the army wants that disintegration. I understand it. But the problem is that government should know how to get these people into society and not leave them to be the next army for Bakrim, for paramilitares, or for whatever, for ELN, or for common criminals, and try to rebuild their lives. I think they should, but you should read that it's three days ago because it's an excellent experience in the field, what she's saying, what is happening today. Excuse me, sir. Uh, we have closed for further questions. We thank you very much for having attended our very brilliant lecture this afternoon. And um, let's give a final round of applause. <laughs>